Me too. 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 And me too. Me too. Me too. Me too. In my early 20s, I was working in New York City and so proud of being a young New York City businesswoman and sophisticated. I was uh, doing cold calls at uh, different businesses, and a businessman, after a, a presentation, he invited me out for dinner in a comedy club. I had never been to a comedy club. I was so excited. Um, I did not know that that invitation came with date rape. Um, unfortunately, after the comedy club, we were coming upstairs, and he just kept following me to my apartment, and at each door, I kept trying to push him away. And finally, he just pushed me through the final door, and I just, I just figured, you know, let's get this rape over with fast. Let's just get it over with. I was so demoralized. I know the next few days, I couldn't even remember what happened, who I was. I was confused. It, it was, I never spoke of it. Years went by before I ever recognized I was even raped. You actually may have saved yourself some trouble. An uncle of mine gave me fatherly advice when I was a teenager. He told me not to resist when men tried to force themselves on me. He said that men liked and got turned on when women struggled and resisted their advances. What about cases where a woman is physically unable to say no? You mean like when a woman is drugged and unconscious? In 1973, I made a trip to Yugoslavia. I landed in Ljubljana, and the first night I was there convinced me I could no longer travel alone. When I went out for dinner, suddenly six burly gentlemen squeezed into my booth. The restaurant owner did nothing, and this convinced me that I had to join a tour group. I had always traveled alone without a tour. The next morning, I signed up with the tour group, staying at my hotel. When we got to Dubrovnik, I was sent to a hotel across the street because I was the only single. Everyone else was, uh, had double accommodations, and there were no single rooms left. The tour guide kept asking me out, and I kept refusing him. One day, we were scheduled for a bus tour of the Montenegro area, where the temperature was 110 degrees. The air conditioning on the bus was not working, and I got terribly sick on the ride. The bus driver had to keep stopping for me to heave at the side of the bus. One of the tourists, who was a doctor, gave me a pill to take to calm my stomach. He said when I got back to the hotel, I would fall into a deep sleep and the effects of the terrible ride would be finished. When I got back to my room, I locked the door and fell into bed closed. Suddenly, in the middle of the night, I woke up unclothed with the tour guide on top of me. I screamed and got the hotel manager up, even though it was the middle of the night. I asked how the tour guide had gotten to my, into my room, and he said the guide told him I was expecting him, so he gave him the key. I complained to the authorities in Dubrovnik and to the American embassy. No one did anything. That killed foreign travel for me. My first rape occurred in college without the prelude of a nice dinner out. I was at a party at a fraternity house. Must have been my senior year of college. It was in the early 1970s. <clears throat> Everyone was drinking and smoking, smoking the J, of course, with abandon. Back in those days, you could still legally drink at 18 in New York State. Although I was drinking wine pretty freely, I wasn't smoking. But I do remember feeling a bit woozy and going into the bathroom. Next thing I know, a young man joined me in the bathroom and started making out with me. I must have passed out, because the next thing I remember is, is coming to with him on top of me, pumping away. 
I remember saying, stop, 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 please stop. He did and quickly left. I pulled up my pants and quickly exited as well. I remember my friend Jean asking, are you all right? Embarrassed, I just said yes. Later, I asked another friend, Anne, I, I think George, uh, that I think that was his name, gave it to me in the bathroom. She said, yes, he did. I don't have any respect for a guy who would do that to a girl. <clears throat> Looking back later, way later, I figured somebody must have dropped drugs in my wine. Spiking a girl's drink is nothing new. But I thought that what happened was somehow my fault. On top of it all, I hesitate to say he gave me a nasty case of the clap. I was ashamed and didn't tell anyone, but it wasn't until years later that I came to grips with the fact that I had been raped. Funny. After all this time, I can still close my eyes and see his face, but I don't even know if George is his real name. Let's get real. I think most men don't give it a second thought. Some celebrities cannot imagine that any woman would want to turn them down. Guess they think they're God's gift to the world. When I was in my early 20s, I did a low-budget horror film, The Shriek of the Mutilated. I had the lead role and delusions of grandeur. I thought I was going to be a star. So when a well-known radio and television celebrity introduced me to a gentleman who was supposed to be a manager, and he offered to take me to Hollywood to, to introduce me to some agents and directors, I was very excited. My first clue that something was not right was when he told me that I was going to fly as his wife. <clears throat> I did not like the idea of not being on the plane's manifest. But the big red flag went up when he told me, I'm going to tell the agents you're not a hooker. I thought, why would there even be a question that I was one? I didn't like the smell of it, so I decided not to go. The so-called manager was very, very upset. My celebrity friend later told me I was too nice a girl to pass around. So I figured he must have been supplying these agents and directors with girls on a regular basis. Glad I didn't go. I might have been stranded in a strange place in a compromised or even dangerous position. Uh, yeah, well, we're back to the 1960s and I had had loads of press in Hollywood because they were grooming me to be another Marilyn Monroe type. My photo had appeared in several newspapers, magazines, and this exposure caused a female fan to kind of call my manager several times, almost like a stalker. Finally, I did speak to her and decided to meet the person she insisted I should meet. My manager was suspicious, so he called the FBI wanting to check this guy out. They called back and made a time to meet with me and my manager at a diner in Sunset Boulevard. The FBI told us they were searching for this guy and would I help to catch him? I was frightened, but well, we decided that I would do what I could do. And, and that is when the FBI, myself and my manager, drove together up the strange and winding road to the meeting that we were given. The building appeared to look a lot like an old warehouse from years ago. And when I got out of the car, the others waited right there in the driveway for me. A man came towards me and escorted me to this large entrance. When that huge door opened, I went inside and looked around. There was nobody. And then I heard a noise. I looked up, and there was this strange gentleman and a, on a balcony peering down at me suspiciously. Then his assistants announced my name, and as he walked away, he shouted up to his boss, who was up on the balcony, that I had people waiting for me outside. Well, suddenly, the boss man ran off that balcony like a bat out of hell and raced out of the building, leaving me standing there stunned until somebody finally opened the door for me to exit. According to the FBI, this man was kidnapping sort of blonde women for rich foreign benefactors. So thank God my kidnapping was finally interrupted by the fact that I was not alone. I had protection. Although I was saved from a fate that could have been worse than death, for me anyway, the FBI did not get to capture their man that night. 
I have a similar story. In 1961, I was cast in a pre-Broadway tryout of a play by a prominent American playwright. We were at a famous summer theater in upstate New York. It was a great company with a couple of big names, and the author told me he was pleased with my work. His secretary alerted me on a day off that uh, his boss was hosting a party at his home, several miles distant and he offered to drive me there and back. Well, of course I said yes. We set off after dinner and arrived at the author's house in semi-darkness. There was no one there. The house was dark and my chauffeur said he had the key. I, I was young but not totally naive. I was alarmed and furious. He said we would spend the night. I said, no, I want to go back. He said, no. I told him I would get out and hitch my way back in the dark. At that moment, I realized how Carol and so many other young women must feel in a similar, similar situation. The playwright secretary finally relented and drove me back in strained silence. I witnessed a director coming on to actors during the audition process. During the 80s, I frequently stage managed, and this particular year, I was stage managing an entire season of summer stock in a theater in upstate New York. The director was a, a member of Stage Directors and Choreographers Union and a respected member of the theater community. I was astounded when I found myself in the audition room during callbacks and was surprised to hear the director propositioning young male actors in their individual callbacks. He would tell them how much he wanted them and would try to elicit the promise of rooming together during the stock season. I put my head down pretending to be busy with uh, paperwork and feigning not to hear what was going on. Nevertheless. I was disturbed to say the least and probably should have reported it to the union, but I needed the work and was afraid I'd lose the job. The climate was not conducive to whistleblowers back then. I am still deeply ashamed that I didn't have the courage to speak out for those fellows. Some of them later told me they went along with it as they too needed the work. As a humorous side note, none of them did room with the director that summer. Years later, I heard that he had been violently murdered at the hands of a trick. Looking back now, I feel sorry for him. Is that karma payback? I don't know. I was spending a week in Fire Island one time, and I met this very friendly fellow on the beach. We started swimming together and avoiding the waves, and we had a lot of laughs and very, very good conversation. And he suggested that we meet that evening for dinner and drinks, which I thought was a great idea. And we did meet, and the dinner was lovely. The atmosphere was very pleasant. And he said to me, why don't you come over to my place for a while? I thought, OK, why not? And we eventually made love. And right after having made love, he said to me, OK, get up, go. What do you mean, go? Uh, he said, well, I want you to go back to your place. Well, I was shocked. I mean, he had been so friendly, so warm, so humorous, and this cold statement about that I had to leave him right away after having sex. I, I didn't know what to say, actually. I, I was furious, but, but also surprised. Well, I got up and I got dressed and I did leave. And I thought to myself, what could I have said to him? So I mumbled to myself as I left his place, drop dead. But I, you know what? I blamed myself because I didn't have good judgment. But how could I tell? Because he seemed very nice. What a bad surprise. I have a story about a pussy grabber. Back in the 1970s, I was up for a centerfold in a girly magazine. Believe it or not, I was really hot looking then, and I didn't mind appearing 
semi-nude or even totally nude in a photo shoot. Well, an agent set me up for this job, so I thought it was legit. It was going to be Halloween, goblins, witches, ghosts, the whole nine yards. I suppose I was supposed to be the centerpiece witch. Well, I went up for the interview, and the producer had me back a couple of times. So on the third or fourth time, when he said, well, I'm going to have to uh, have you take off your clothes and see your body so I can see how you're going to look for the shoot, I thought it was totally legit. So, And I thought, well, this is how it's done. So I stripped down to my underwear and uh, thought nothing of it. And all of a sudden this guy starts, he whips out his, his penis and starts masturbating and then lunges towards my crotch to try to grab it. And I, I just was astounded. And I grabbed my dress, my little red and blue uh, one-piece dress, threw it back on, ran to the door, threw it wide open, and I said, I don't have to take that from anybody. Left him standing there with his wimpy little penis hanging out. And would you believe this? Later on, he called me up and apologized. Hollywood lost. The death of Monroe. The death of innocence. The death of a dream. The death of Hollywood. That's what it all means. Their illusions are gone and the nightmares begin. That fast lane where nobody wins. Glittersville's pathway to fame where everyone is playing the game. The game played, paved by heartbroken desires and lost in fantasy mires. Hollywoodland, sandy beaches and golden sunsets, deep tans and darkened nights where you will sell your soul for just a tiny bite and the days and the weeks go by and the months and the years fly while you glimpse the brass ring that constantly passes you by. In that merry-go-round, fairyland known to the world as Tinseltown. Love Evolution. Go get them, ladies. I'm here to say they've been swine, not pearls. And I mean that in a radical way. You see, what goes around comes around, and it is finally time to pay. It was the forefathers of this country, the biggest rapist of them all. It all didn't matter because our skin was black, so let us fall. And remember Anita Hill? They placed that black man to be the highest judge. So now if you clear up your headache of such undignified men, you will come to realize they are the power structure within. A system très malade that you keep giving your power to and expect the qualities of life that were not ever in their foundation to deliver as they spoke the rhetoric of politicians, which should be labeled straight up hypocrites. Their snow job to have power and control over the masses of minds for the collateral reaping of their almighty dollars. So I warn you, ladies, in your outing their egregious acts, be ready to fight, because these demons are not about to let the light in. Now, if all this darkness raising its ugly head should fill you with fear, here's my proposal, and I will say it loud and clear. And I'll say it loud and clear. Dump all these men with impunity, the politicians, the self-serving hierarchies of those without self-dignity, the low life of machismo orientation who feel their worth through raping and brutalizing the opposite sex, inclusive of homosexual, bisexual, transgender, and all other labels given to further alienate and divide us on our earth experience and return to love. Love evolution. Let art reign. The musicians give the music to soothe our souls, lead us to our truth with the frequencies that speak directly to our individual core experiences. The dancers 
lead us in the movements of sheer delight, have the ability to even relocate our pain to a higher plane. Why, they may even bring us all to our sixth sense again. The writers, poets, have always of enlightened mind exposed the obvious and taken us to the higher consciousness by design. The singers have permeated our hearts with exuberant emotions, have brought us empathy to keep us afloat, brought us together in venues of shared camaraderie across all notions of definitions that seek to tear us apart. All creators of positive implementation to uplift and unite, not conquer and divide. With all these positive forces of beings already here, why can't we just make all those so hate-driven disappear? Love evolution! Make the ultimate quantum leap. Love and respect for all sentient existence within the nurturing and healing bosom of our Mother Earth. Love equals life. Hate equals death. If we are to survive as a species, it's as simple as that. Humans are not the only existing matter in the universe. For some men, it's just all about the sex. You're absolutely right about that. You know, uh, I have a, a friend, a decent man, who happens to be a Broadway actor. You probably know his name if I said it, so I won't. And he doesn't understand why you can't just F like bunnies and then go home. He'd get really, really annoyed when a woman wanted to hang around after having sex or when the woman wanted him to hang around if he was at her house. Nope, they just don't want to have a relationship a lot of the time. Not all men are monsters. I support, respect, and appreciate women. You're right about that more men were like you, the world would be a better place. That being said, sex when it's shared in a loving, kind atmosphere can be very fulfilling and nourishing. However, when it's just done for the sake of sex, one can feel very alienated and isolated, scooped out and left to high and dry periods. And that's something that I never want to experience again. It all seems to be about the misuse of power, privilege, and position, doesn't it? Power corrupts, privilege entitles, position enables, and wealth dehumanizes. Let's give power to the people. Yes, if that means power to the people who mean to use it for the greater good. Job is and out, most of us have had broken dreams. Or at least an assault of our sense of propriety and dignity. Some roughed up. Some raped. Some harassed over and over. Till we come to expect it. Until we begin to believe it's normal. But it's not normal. If we can make it on our own merit and not how wide or how often we open our legs. Or survival. We don't want to punish others. We just want to live with dignity. And with respect. Some people may think because we're lying. we have kept these secrets for so long. We seniors have held on to our silence for far too long. Leave to speak out. And empowered. Once and for all, we have found our voice. We, we seniors finally break our silence. We, we finally say, me, me too. too. Me too. Me too. Me too. Thank you.
Me too.